Welcome to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Our team's goal is to present science-based information about gardening and all things nature in New York's Hudson Valley. Host Gene and Tim, along with team members Teresa and Linda, are master gardener volunteers for New York's Columbia and Greene counties. So if you're interested in gardening or nature or nuggets of information about what's happening outside your door, settle in. Enjoy the conversation. Whatever the season, we have something to say. I am Tim Kennelty. And I'm Jean Thomas. And welcome to Nature Calls, conversations from the Hudson Valley. What are we talking about today, Jean? I always ask you that question. What are we talking about? That's because I always know. We're talking yeah. about the cover-up. That's one of our favorites because we're in it, right? That's Well, why else? <laughs> yeah. Wow. And we're talking about two of our favorite plants. I'm going to talk about ragwort, which sounds horrible, but it's a wonderful plant. It's a wonderful ground cover plant that I've just discovered, and it spreads really well, and it's a great pollinator plant. It's a really good plant. Have you grown it? No. Yeah. Oh, okay. There you go. But I have grown climbing hydrangea. See, it's not, that's not one of my favorites, but uh, you're going to talk about that now. Well, it'll so, grow on you. <laughs> See what I did there? It's a great climbing plant, right? It is a massive climbing plant. Climbing yeah, plant. Yeah. You can only put it where you've got room for it and support for it. So it comes with a warning, but oh my goodness, it's gorgeous. And then we're getting to talk about more interesting things. What's that? The veggie patch. Yeah. Cucurbits. I could barely pronounce cucurbits. That means the cucumber family. Did you know that they're the most used plants for human consumption? I didn't know that. That's what Teresa talks about. That's right. Cucumbers and pumpkins and squash and watermelons. Oh, my. Yeah. Oh, my. Yeah. They are really important crops in midsummer. They need a lot of sun, and they're delicious. So she's going to talk about all about how to grow them and how to manage them and take care of them. Then we're going outside in the yard. We're talking about ticks on hits and myths. What are we talking about with ticks? Well, we found out something really interesting. What's that? What's that? There's a myth about opossums. Possums and chickens and guinea hens? Who eats ticks, right? What do you need to have to get rid of those ticks? Well, that doesn't get rid of the ticks, but it does eat the adults and cuts the population down. Huh. So timing's important. So the question is, is it really important to have these animals in the yard? Does it get rid of all your ticks or not? That's the myth, right? That's what we want to find out. I can't wait to find that Me out. too. I need to know. You're listening to Nature Calls, conversations from the Hudson Valley. Stay tuned for the cover up. Hi, I'm Jean Thomas. And I'm Tim Kennelty. And welcome to another edition of The Cover-Up, where we talk about our favorite ground covers and vines. So my ground cover today, Jean, is golden ragwort, or golden ground cell, or just ragwort. Okay, ready for this? Other common names include squawweed, life root, golden senencio, uncum, uncum root, wawweed, false valerian, coughweed, kokosh weed, ragweed, staggerwort, and St. James wort. Wow, this is obviously a plant with quite a bit of history. They have so many common names. Most notably, Native Americans use this plant for reproductive issues. The plant <laughs> is named for 20th century Canadian botanist John Packer, and Aurea refers to its bright yellow flowers. So that's enough about history and origin. Why did I just choose this plant as a favorite ground cover? Well, a few years ago, I read an article about dealing with invasive grasses and perennials. Instead of pulling or cutting large areas of invasive weeds, the author was experimenting with planting native species that could outcompete plants like garlic mustard and stoat grass. The plant that she thought might be up to the task was golden ragwort. Wow, to me, that's worth a try. Ragwort is a native perennial in the Asteraceae family. It's found throughout eastern North America, growing in swamps, forests, ravines, and riparian areas. 
It's short in stature with the flowering stems rising typically one to two feet above basal clump of heart-shaped tooth semi-evergreen dark green leaves. The bright yellow daisy-like flowers appear in early spring and provide pollen and nectar to visiting pollinators that include little carpenter bees, cuckoo bees, and various sweat bees, as well as a number of surfid flies and fireflies. The leaves of this plant are host to at least 17 different butterfly and moth species. And none of the herbivores, including the deer, seem to have it on their menu. But the reason I like this plant is that it really does take off and is a formidable foe against weeds. It spreads through underground rhizomes and by self-sowing seed to form clumping colonies. It's not picky about soil conditions and it can grow in wet areas as well as being able to take some drought. And it's said to grow in full sun to just about full shade. I'm experimenting with this in my garden and have planted it in a variety of conditions, including a semi-shaded ditch and a weedy area in full sun. So, so far, both patches are doing well and slowly expanding. If you do try ragwort, especially to outcompete weeds, plant as many as your wallet will bear. You're not only looking to push out weeds, but create a beautiful display of those glowing yellow flowers to brighten up the garden in early spring. This is a plant you probably won't find at your local big box store or even maybe your local nursery, so you may want to check out specialty native nurseries or online sources. But with a plant like this with bright yellow flowers in early spring, when not much else is blooming, that support wildlife and easy to grow and most importantly, might just push out those weeds and invasives, this is one well worth the hunt. What do you have on deck for us, Jean, for a vine? I don't know. I'm making notes about your little yellow thingamajig that I'm going to have to come over to your house and look at. Yeah, yeah, you should. You should, actually, because mine mine are expanding, and they're actually doing what they're supposed to do, which is push out those weeds. And if they attract cuckoo bees, I'm in. Hey, you want some cuckoo bees in your yard, don't you? I probably have some, don't I? I think you do. (laughs) Maybe cuckoo something, yeah. Well, I'm not going with the native line today. I'm doing a hydrangea. Now, everybody has a favorite hydrangea, from the big snowball bush type to the delicate lace cap, from white to pink to the singular blue that we see at seaside gardens. I have at least three favorites among the shrub types, but there's another one I'm particularly fond of. Its formal name is Hydrangea Anomala Petiolaris, the climbing hydrangea. The hydrangea name refers to a water holder, referring to the shape of the seed pods. Actually, the name is accurate, too, if you interpret it to mean any hydrangea plant likes plenty of water. The anomalous species name means unlike the others, anomaly, because it climbs. Petiolaris is a reference to the petioles, or stalks of the leaves. Technically, there are two climbing hydrangea types, the anomala and the petiolaris but they're so closely related that they seem to be combined in the nursery trade and are sold by either name or both together with little differentiation. As you may know, I have a fondness for the unusual, and that's why one of the reasons I love this plant. They were introduced around 1860, so Tim, it's not a native. But they're not aggressive, so, you know, it's okay. First of all, it's a hydrangea like everybody knows about, but it climbs. It has great self-esteem. When you plant one, it may take several years to begin to flower. I'm frugal and bought a small one. It took seven years to flower. I was almost disappointed when it finally happened. I'd begun to enjoy the anticipation so much. I was entertained by the growth up the ash tree I had given it to climb. The leaves are pretty, a nice bright shiny green, and they have a golden color in the fall. The bark on the trunk is reddish brown and shaggy at maturity, and it sends out aerial roots to grab onto supports. After the leaves fall, the plant is still intriguing with its thick, twisted trunk and branches twining around its support. To grow the hydrangea anomala happily, give it rich organic soil that's slightly acid. Keep it moist as it acclimates and begins to grow. It's happiest with at least partial shade, but doesn't complain in full sun as long as it gets adequate moisture. It may start slowly, obviously, from my seven-year itch there, but will achieve a growth burst just before it reaches flowering age. Be sure the support is sturdy. I'm still recovering from the loss of the ash tree. When the beetles and the woodpeckers were through with it, the ash had vanished, and the poor hydrangea stood there wrapped around a whole lot of nothing. Fortunately, it was old enough to stand on its own trunk, but I'm still challenged in trying to create an appropriate support. 
The flowers are interesting too, although you wouldn't think so hearing me go on about the plant. They're fluffy white clusters of florets in almost flat umbels. An average flower cluster is six to eight inches across, and the individual florets can be over an inch across. In June, there are masses of white flowers covering the whole plant. Like all hydrangeas, they can be dried for arrangements. The most spectacular one I ever saw was in Virginia, climbing a tulip tree to a height of 40 feet. Here in our zones 4 and 5, they might not gain the height, but they can be trained to considerable width if you have a barn you want to hide. So if you have the room to do it justice and the patience to let it take its time, this climbing hydrangea can become a treasure. Oh, I almost forgot. The deer taste test the leaf buds in the spring, so some fencing and spraying might be wise. It's worth it. And that's it for today for the cover-up. You're listening to Nature Calls, conversations from the Hudson Valley. Stay tuned for The Veggie Patch. And now it's time for The Veggie Patch. I'm Teresa Golden, a Master Gardener volunteer for Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Greene Counties. Today, let's talk about the food group that is most used for human consumption. Want to guess what it is? Cucurbits. Despite the strange name, the common members of this family include such things as cucumbers, pumpkins, summer and winter squash, watermelons, and muskmelons. They can easily be identified by their bright yellow flowers. Each vine produces both a male and female flower. Cucurbits grow best in summer when days and nights are consistently warm. They do need full sun and well-drained soil. For best results, consider adding organic matter before you plant them. Cucumbers are a home garden favorite. There's nothing like the crunch of a fresh cucumber right off the vine. You can grow either the slicing cucumbers that are typically 5 to 8 inches long or the pickling ones. They tend to be about 2 to 3 inches long. The pickling ones are smaller and mature faster than the slicing varieties. Both types are available as bushes or vines. Bush varieties take up less space and are ideal for containers. The vine type can be trained to climb up a support or you can just let them sprawl on the ground. To train vine varieties, space plants at least one foot apart in front of an anchor trellis. When they are about two feet tall, their tendrils will start to attach to the structure and the plant will climb up about six to eight feet. Vines on a support tend to produce a higher yield as well as straighter and longer cucumbers. From a yield perspective, you can expect to get an average of 15 cucumbers per plant. So plan accordingly so you don't end up inundating your friends and family. Cucumbers like full sun, good air circulation, and soil that is well-drained and rich in organic matter. They are easy to direct sow in the garden but you can also start them indoors about 8 to 10 weeks before the last frost date. Repot the seedlings into 3-inch pots when they are 3 to 4 inches tall and have two sets of leaves. If you prefer the ease of buying seedlings, make sure to buy stocky plants with shiny green leaves and no flowers. Home-grown or purchased seedlings can be transported in the garden when the soil temperature exceeds 60 degrees, so you might have to wait a few weeks after the last frost date. Allow at least 12 inches between plants. Handle the transplants gently to minimize disturbance to the roots. It does help to spread a 3 to 5 inch layer of mulch under a 6 inch tall seedling to help with weed control and water retention. Make sure to always keep the soil moist, but avoid working with the vines when the leaves are wet. You're better off waiting until the morning dew or rain has evaporated to prevent the spread of diseases. Harvest the fruit regularly to keep the plant producing. If ripe fruit is left on the plant too long, it signals to the plant to stop producing new flowers and thus new cucumbers. A poor yield is usually due to a lack of water or too little fertilizer. Bitterness in cucumbers can be caused by high temperatures or drought or by picking overripe fruit. Cucumber beetles are a common pest. They are striped or spotted 
greenish-yellow insects that feed on young leaves. Covering plants with row covers and using mulch can help to deter them from breeding. Squash, another member of the cucurbit family, is also one of the most bountiful vegetables you can grow. It can be found in multiple varieties and shapes. Examples include zucchini and pumpkin, as well as yellow, acorn, spaghetti, or butternut squashes, among others. Summer and winter varieties have different characteristics. Planting and growing requirements, however, are similar except for the time to maturity. Summer squash is native to North America, where it was planted by Native Americans as a companion to corn and beans in a trio known as the Three Sisters. Each plant in the trio benefited each other. The corn provided support for climbing beans, while the beans fixed nitrogen in the soil, and the large bushy leaves of the squash acted as a living mulch, cooling the soil and helping it to retain moisture. The prickly squash leaves also help to deter unwanted garden pests such as raccoons, deer, and rabbits. If you're interested in growing the three sisters, bush type of summer squash are preferable as opposed to the vining and sprawling types. Summer squash typically requires 50 to 65 frost-free days to mature. They are harvested when their vines are soft and edible and when the fruit is, quote, immature. They can be eaten raw or cooked. By contrast, winter squash takes 60 to 100 days to mature, and it's harvested when the rinds are hard and thick. As a result, they have a longer storage life. They also tend to be drier and more fibrous than summer squashes and must be cooked. Like cucumbers, both summer and winter squash grow best once air temperature averages 65 degrees. Squash seeds can be sown directly in the ground at least a week after your last frost date. Or you can purchase seedlings or consider starting them indoors. This should be done two weeks to a month before your last spring frost. Transplants are often planted on slight mounds or hills. Sow two to three seeds per hill, three to four inches deep, and placed four to six feet apart. Squash requires regular and even watering. Keep the soil moist, but avoid watering the leaves. Squash blossoms are edible, so feel free to pick the first blossoms that appear. Remove the inner parts and use the petals to add color to appetizers or salads. Harvesting the first flowers doesn't hurt the plant production at all, because the early flowers bear pollen and no fruit. These veggies grow quickly in warm weather, so check your garden regularly, as you could be picking them two to three times a week. Plenty to eat freeze, give away to neighbors. Just remember that the larger summer squash gets, the tougher the skin and seeds are. Larger squash is great for baking, so don't despair if you miss one. Allow winter squash to mature on the vine, but harvest them when their skins are hard, but before the first frost. After harvest, winter squash should be allowed to cure outdoors and dry and toughen the skins before storage in a cool, dry, ventilated area for up to five to six months. Vine borers often injure these plants. Prevention is the best defense against them. Use floating row covers until the flowers start to bloom is one approach. Other conditions such as bacterial wilt, mosaic virus, powdery mildew, and blight can also affect squash. Make sure to clean up any plant debris at the end of the season and turn the soil in the spring to bury insect pupae to help control these issues. Enjoy experimenting with a wide range of cucurbits that are available to grow. Until next time, this is Teresa Golden with the Veggie Patch. You're listening to Nature Calls, conversations from the Hudson Valley. Stay tuned for Hits and Mitts. Hello and welcome back to another segment of Hits and Myths. I'm Devin Russ, Master Gardener Volunteer for Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties. Today's myth is about opossums. Everyone is worried about ticks. There are lots of scary diseases that you can catch from a tick bite. Lyme disease is the most famous, 
but also babesiosis, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, anaplasmosis, and at least 10 other diseases. It's possible to spray areas to kill ticks. Unfortunately, the pesticide chemicals that are effective at bringing down the tick populations are not specific to ticks. They will also kill insects that you would like to have in your area, like butterflies, honeybees, fireflies, and ladybugs. And birds and animals that eat treated ticks or insects may be poisoned. If you do use pesticides, always follow the instructions carefully. It is important for safety to use the right amount. And it is important for effectiveness to apply pesticides at the right time of year and in the right weather conditions. Even if you do use pesticides, the CDC recommends that you still take precautions against ticks. Use repellents on your pets and check them often for ticks. Use repellents or insecticidal products on your clothing and shoes. Check yourself and your kids for ticks frequently. Shower shortly after coming in from a tick-infested area, etc. You can also reduce your exposure to ticks by removing brush and mowing often in the most frequently used parts of your yard. But all of that is a lot of work. What about enlisting some helpers? There are animals that have a reputation for eating lots of ticks. Can they help you keep the tick population down? Chickens are known to eat ticks and can help hunt them down in your yard if you have the space for chickens and the time to take care of them. Guinea hens have an even bigger reputation as tick eaters. Lots of farmers and homesteaders keep guinea fowl, especially for tick control. You need a lot of space for these birds. They range far and they are noisy. The radio show Living on Earth did a piece about guinea hens. They spoke to a Vermont mom who used to pick ticks off her kids daily. After they got a flock of guineas, the kids can play in the woods and they rarely see a tick. But the Living on Earth crew also spoke to a tick specialist who pointed out that the guinea birds mostly eat adult ticks. Unfortunately, it's the tiny nymphs, baby ticks, who transmit most disease to people. Of course, having fewer adults means there will be fewer nymphs, but the recommendation is still to be vigilant about tick checks. Opossums are another animal that has a reputation for consuming lots of ticks. Opossums are interesting critters. They are marsupials, which means they carry their babies in a pouch, like kangaroos. There are lots of marsupials in Australia, but opossums are the only American marsupial. They are very common in the eastern U.S., but not often seen since they are active only at night. Opossums groom themselves frequently, like cats, and they eat the ticks they remove from their fur. Opossums got their destroyer of ticks reputation because a research lab wanted to learn how different animals interact with tick populations. The researchers exposed six different species, including opossums and mice, to 100 ticks each. They looked to see how successful the ticks were with each species. Success, for a tick, was defined as the tick attaching to the animal, getting engorged with blood, and then detaching from the animal to move on to the next tick life stage. With mice, the ticks were very successful. Lots of engorged ticks were found alive on the floor of the mouse cage. But with opossums, the researchers did not find any engorged ticks on the cage floor. The possums ate them. The researchers were interested to learn that a high population of mice would support a high population of ticks. But lots of reporters were more interested to hear that opossums are eating ticks. Extrapolating from the number of ticks placed in the possum cage and then eaten, some people concluded that an opossum might eat thousands of ticks a season. But other researchers decided to check that extrapolation by looking at the stomach contents of wild possums. They did not find ticks. So much for extrapolating. Apparently, possums held in a small cage infested with ticks will eat those ticks. But possums out in your yard will eat other stuff. They don't go looking for ticks as food. So, Are opossums or other animals great allies in the fight against ticks? 
Just like with most real-world questions, at least part of the answer is, it's complicated. It certainly doesn't hurt to have insect eaters like opossums or guinea fowl in your yard. But even so, if your yard includes prime tick habitat, like woods frequented by deer, then you will still have some ticks. An interesting takeaway from the study that gave opossums a reputation as tick eaters is that since ticks do so well living on mice, anyone who eats mice will help keep down the tick population. So perhaps we should all give a thank you nod to snakes and owls in our yards. To end on a positive note for all of us who would like good tick control, there are some living things that will help us manage ticks, and they are fungi. Metarhizum anisopliae is a fungus that causes fatal disease in ticks. It is now available in commercial products for tick control. There are also other potential biocontrols based on parasites of ticks, such as tiny nematode worms and a parasitic wasp. It's hard to believe that something as tiny and parasitic as a tick has its own parasites. But as satirist Jonathan Swift wrote in 1733, naturalists observe a flea has smaller fleas that on him prey, and those have smaller yet to bite him, and so proceed ad infinitum. Let's hope we can use some of the tick's own parasites and diseases to keep them from making us sick. Thank you for listening to this episode. This is Devin Russ. Goodbye. That concludes another episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. We would like to thank Sandra Linnell and Devin Connolly from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Greene Counties for production support. And a special thank you to our listeners for joining us on this episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. You can find links to any of the topics mentioned in this episode at our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org. Comments and suggestions for future topics may be directed to us at Columbia Green MGB at Cornell.edu or on the CCE Master Gardener Volunteers of Columbia and Green County's Facebook page. For more information about Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties, visit our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org or visit us in Hudson or in Acre. Cornell Cooperative Extension provides equal programming and employment opportunities 